What's up? How are you? I'm well, man. Thank you. Thank you for that, too, man. That was unnecessary, but I, I got it. It's, no, I'm it's not. not uh, it's not that big a deal, man. Yeah, but I got to... I gotta at least look out a little bit. I can't have you paying for the calls, no, right? I get you. I, I, I got you. I understand that. You know how it is. But I'm just saying. It's. I mean, I'm on a budget, but I'm not broke. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me yeah. tell you something. When I was in there, Troy, guess what? Anybody sent me money, man. I was happy with it. You hear me? Of course. So. Of course, because it does make a difference in you know the quality of our life. With, with I mean, anybody that says it, it, it doesn't amount to anything, uh, try living without it, you know? Yeah, no doubt. So, <laughs> it's real, it's real, it, it reminds you real quick that it's necessary. Definitely necessary, man. It makes things easier, you know what I mean? Absolutely, man. And I know, I know what the struggle's like in there, man, so, you know, no, listen, man, I, appreciate it. I talked to your wife, right? I told her, she kind of told me some of the stuff that you might want to talk about. I told her some of the stuff that I want to talk about. I kind of gave her a little bit of um, advice as to what I think you guys should do, and we'll talk about that uh, maybe later. Um, but as far as, you know, everything goes with you, man, I mean, you want to do the interview? Yeah, I'm fine with it. All right. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, let's talk a little bit about Paul Payne, because I know that you want to talk a little bit about that and the Blackman fight and all that stuff before anything happened with you, right? Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about that, but you know the one thing that I do the one thing that I do want to point out, you know, for like the viewers is that there was, you know, obviously that Gladiator Days thing came out on HBO. Some of the stuff, you know, wasn't true and exact. They painted a picture, you know, from what your wife told me that they painted a picture that they wanted you to just be this supreme racist that killed this black dude in cold blood for no reason. And I kind of want you to explain that type of stuff too. And I'm, I'm, because, uh, I didn't, yeah, but the, the, the approach from the gladiator days, I was supposed to be uh, one of uh, six uh, younger offenders of living in, in prison, just of, you know, life in prison, and, and what that all entails, uh, coming to prison as a teenager, and, and that stuff. Unfortunately, they decided to focus just on me and, you know, make the film as the, you know, the scary white guy and that type of, you know, perspective. That's why you don't see any of my family in the film because yeah. it wasn't brought to me on that level. It wasn't, hey, let's tell, you know, this situation, what's the, the background, what's the story, this, that way. So, it was over three years. Of, of It was 99, 2000, 2001 is when we did audio and video uh, interviews. Yeah. And then it aired for the first time in, I believe it was February or March of 2002 with uh, HBO. And then I seen it uh, a few months down the a few months later that year by my attorney he said hey did you see this is why I asked you not to do this is because this is exactly why you don't do them and I'm like damn you know and it just upset my family you know my friends my childhood friends like that to say hey why did you let them why didn't they come talk to us well I said because I didn't know it was going to be a film about me man. yeah you know, it, it, it just that wasn't the, the direction that I was told it was going to go. And they said, okay, and we asked you not to do another one. And that's why I haven't done another one. Okay. And I've, I've been asked almost every year. And it's uh, from different, not just with the HBO people, but, and, and I'm cool with some of the people from HBO. It's just they're... You know, they're doing the job. They've asked me about things to clarify. They said, hey, we can do a clarification of things. And I just said, no, I'll pass, man. Because I asked yeah. for the footage that wasn't used. Because there's, there's hours of it. Yeah. And, you know, they cut it the way that they want to 
to to show it. So because for my own family to show because uh, I mentioned my family, my childhood, because uh, my family's great. I had a good childhood. I don't have you know anything to to say about that. I made bad decisions on my own as a kid in high school, and you know once I came to prison. I had to adapt to everything. I don't come from a family of generations of incarcerated people. I've never visited anybody in the jail. I never went and visited anybody in prison. No one in my family's been in prison. So that whole adjustment for me and my family came as I went through the process. And I went through a full trial. You know, it wasn't a plea agreement. It wasn't, went through a trial. They offered me a plea agreement. And, you know, they were saying I did stuff that I didn't do. So I said, no, I'll, I'll take my chances at trial. Unfortunately, I lost. They gave me life with no parole. As a teen, as an 18 year old kid, I went to Max. I had to sign a paper to be in population to release all litigation away from my family. Because at the time in the 80s, you had to be 20 years old in order to be in general population. In, in Max. Prior to that, you would either be in the hall in, in segregation or you would be in a medium facility until you turned 20 and then they would move you. If your sentence structure was what it was, like life, they would move you to uh, maximum security, which at the time was NSP in Carson City. I signed the waiver. I said, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. I want to be in population if I'm not. I don't want to be in segregation. I don't, you know, yeah. uh, release all that. So I go to population. I'm the youngest white guy on the yard. Go through that ordeal. Go through, you know, a couple of the common adjustments, fights. Troy, let me let me a, let me ask you something though, Troy. Yeah. When you get sentenced, when you get sentenced to life, right? And you're a young, you're a young man. You you blow off the plea agreement, and you get, you know you don't know what you're up against. Probably, you get convicted. You get sentenced to life. What did it feel like when they sentenced you to life, man? It was just a disbelief because the, the, the problem I had, the biggest problem I had, was my attorney telling my family that it was because it was a, it was a big it was a big deal with with my family and. And my attorney and myself of what to do. What's the options? What's the allegations? What's the situation? Okay, this is how much time he would do if he took the plea agreement. But in my opinion, it's hearsay evidence that you know it's other people not trying to do any time that's pointing the finger, saying shit uh, against him to do it. Your youth is going to help you. All, all this because they. they Filed the death penalty in Nevada at the time. You had to be 16 years old uh, in order to qualify for the death sentence. So they did that. They filed it against me and my crime partner. And then the girl was 15 at the time, so she wasn't eligible. They ended up. We split the trial up. She went first. They gave her life with no parole as well. She went to trial. They offered her the same thing at the time. It was two ten to lives. Okay, so you're doing 20 years, you know, minimum. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> then at the, at, for her, so she, she said no. And then, I mean, when we're teenagers and you tell somebody you're going to do more time in prison than you've actually been alive on earth, you don't have any concept of, of that. You yeah. think that's your entire life. You don't have any way of comparing anything and that's why in the film I tried to address that to young people that might be in the situation it's not the rest of your life you know it, it, if you think that you know they don't care if you think that they care about keeping you in prison for the rest of your life don't because they don't care they will keep you there and lie and do whatever they can to win that's their objective is to win their case and they could they could care less that you were a bunch of kids. They didn't have a problem sending you to prison for the rest of your life. They feel you don't have any redeeming qualities at all. They, they, because they knew that the penitentiary or prisons, corrections, is, is supposed to be for rehabilitation. It's supposed to be, hey, make this individual a, per, 
productive member of the community. He got outside of himself. He did whatever unlawful stuff that he did. Okay, you understand everything about it in its entirety of what it is, the severity of things, this and that. But when you have young young people, you know, teens and 20s, I mean, we don't have the, the development in our mind to really understand consequences to the magnitude or really understand any role adults play outside of that, outside of our immediate families. So yeah. when you do come to prison, and it was a warehouse. In, in the 80s, it was no tolerance to anything. They don't care if you're young. They don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, put them in prison. Don't worry about it. It'll fix them. And it's one of the worst things you can do to to a guy or or a gal, especially expose them to maximum security uh, prisoners and the mentality of what these guys are doing. Because some, some people they don't care. They don't care if you're a youngster. They don't care what it. They don't. They want to do whatever they think they need to do to you as an individual or whatever they got going on. They can care less about your family or yourself or anything. It dehumanizes you. I understand that. Let me, let me ask. You you, you know all too well. You know all too well that the first thing it does is dehumanize you. And you have to, you have to have that a little bit in order to tolerate the, the shit that comes with incarceration. Let me ask you this, Troy. So you walk into prison with a life sentence. How old were you when you first walked into that prison with life? 18. 18. Were you nervous walking in there? NSP. What's that? Were you nervous when you walked in there? Of course. Of course. Well, that's what I'm saying. They wanted to put me in an isolation type of like a protective custody thing because of my youth, because of my age, because you didn't have teenagers running around on the yard. Yeah. Because it was the, they would be victimized. But because of my sentence structure, because I had two lives with no parole in 42 years, they gave me the maximum sentence and everything was consecutive. So under the death sentence, that's what I got. The, ne- the very next level of that, I get maximum on everything other than that. So they, so I had to sign a release. Of course, I didn't know what the hell was, what to be expected. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're going to put me in isolation. Well, I want to be housed like everybody else's is house. I've never been here before. I don't know anybody here. What, what are you talking about? Yeah. Well, we've got to sign. There's a litigation problem. There's a legality issue because, you know, your age and because of the severity of, where you're at and I'm like well I'll sign whatever I need to I don't I I know the risk I understand the situation and I'll take my chances you know and and, and fortunately I uh, was around a couple guys that that did have my interest at heart and say this is what you're going to need to do and conduct yourself in this way and stay away from this Yeah. You know, uh, there was a there, there was a 19 year old black kid that was on the yard too at the time, and he was getting ran through the dirt. And back then, you couldn't go up and say something that you ate different, you you lived house different, you didn't. It wasn't integrated or anything. Everybody stuck to their own. Yeah. You know, spot. So <clears throat> I couldn't say that. I looked at him as a young guy because we're the only two teenagers there. Yeah. And I'm like, damn. So I'm kind of like, you know, reflection of how people are behaving in my own like age group. So I see the kid and, you know, he ended up killing himself. He ended up hanging himself. Wow. And I couldn't say nothing. And I'm like, God. And so it just, I had a lot of resentment to the dudes that ran this kid in the ground, you know. And I said, okay, you, you, you fuckers didn't care about this kid. And you, you drove him to the point of him removing himself from the planet rather than deal with you assholes. Yeah. Let's, so that so that, that affected a little bit that, but... But let's... Uh, any, 
Ely opened in 89, and then we were all sent to Ely, sent to Ely to the New Max in 89. So. so let me ask you this, right? Let's talk a little bit about the, the situation with Paul Payne and Blackman. Okay. Tell the people kind of like, you know, how this how this whole thing started, that you didn't just decide one day, hey, I'm going to come out and kill this cat. What led up to that? Their uh, roommates, uh, Lonnie Blackman's uh, roommate, his Sully, and uh, my friend Paul's uh, Sully had gotten a confrontation. Uh, I believe it was about a radio or something. One borrowed the radio or bought the other, and there was some kind of, you know, discrepancy on the deal or, or something like that. So them two get in a fight. Or just a regular, you know, schoolyard fist fight. They're young guys. Paul's out sitting at I'm locked down upstairs and uh, Paul's sitting on the table in because uh, upstairs is single cell, downstairs is, is double cell. So they're fighting and Paul is just letting his you know, silly they're Neither one of them really know what the hell they're doing. So he's sitting there, he's on the table laughing. You know, he's like, so I yell down, I tell Paul, what, what's going on, man? Get him. I tell him, put him in the shower. I said, put both them dudes in the shower, man, because neither one of them want to touch each other. They want to fight, but they don't want to get close enough to do anything. Said, yeah. So as a joke, I'm like, hey, just block them both in the shower. They can't run from each other. Right? Yeah. So he goes, no, he, he tell, Paul says, no, let them let him do their thing, and it's whatever. So Blackman yells down at Paul. He says, oh, you, you think it's funny? But Blackman's locked in the cell because they got the doors locked. But Paul came out of the cell to sit at the table by himself just to make sure everything was going to be okay. So they're fighting, and... Blackman challenges him to fight, says, hey, you know, hey, dude, hey, you know, white boy, you, you, you think it's funny, uh, just stay there, wait till they open my door, me and you get it, and, and Paul's like, oh, what, dude? And he's like, oh, you want to fight? He's like, I don't, I don't care about fighting, dude. We can fight, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> yeah. So they get done, and they rock in, and they open the doors, and sure enough, Blackman comes out, and they get in a fight, and... They get the this water hose kind of deal, and and they're you know they got paintballs and water hoses now in in Nevada. They got live rounds, you know that's how they stop you from doing any kind of like that. So they'll give you a warning shot, and then whoever's standing up is going to get shot until they're laying down. So there's there's no threat. Right? So out here it's a it's a fire hose and a and a paintball gun. Okay. So they get. They get the fire hose, and with the concrete, with it smooth like that, and the, the fire hose is powerful. So if it, you know, it it, it takes the paint off the wall, and if it hits the wall directly, or it'll it'll blow you off your feet, whatever. So they do that, and they're both on the ground. Paul's just holding him because the dude's you know quite bigger than Paul is, and he's on top of him. But Paul has him tied up, so they can't really hurt each other. So. He gets up, and Paul, at, at the time, he's, shit, he's 20 years old, because he's five years younger than me, and I was 25, so he's probably 20, 19, 20, and Paul's like, okay, yeah, you know, good fight, and this and that, and Blackman's in his early 30s, and they're walking back to the cell, and Blackman turns and back fists him and splits his eye open. So Paul's like, oh, all right, dude. Come up now. Under the stairs is the only dry part on the bottom on the bottom tier of the section. So in Blackman's cells, like he's in, I think the third cell from the corner. So he's right close to that too. So he goes to his cell. His his cell is telling him, no, come in, rack in, all this stuff. So Paul's like, no, come out here, come out here under the stairs. And he goes, no, come in, come in my cell. Like, well, I'll, I'll kill you right here. And he's talking about in this doorway, right? He yeah. Said, I'll, I'll kill you right here. Come in, come in here. And I don't want Paul going in there by himself, you know. And, and there's no other person out there other than his Sally, and, and his mm -hmm. Sally's really no help to him uh, from the situation of what we just seen. So I don't want, you know, him going in the cell with these two guys. So, you know, my gay Paul, come here. And. 
he comes to, to my cell, I have a conversation with him. He goes back downstairs and one of the guys think I gave him a weapon. Okay, so this, this dude named Billy Price. And this is all came out in my trial and stuff. So all this stuff I'm telling you is public record. Yeah. And everything that I've told you is, that, that hadn't been addressed in court, which the majority of it has, the other stuff is substantiated by uh, prison incident reports and write-ups. Let me ask so, you this. Are you going to be able to call me right back if this phone hangs up on us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I will. So, uh, so we, we go down, one of the dudes, one of the other guys uh, thinks I gave him a weapon, so he starts, he starts, you know, getting loud with me on the chair you did this you did I said dude I, I don't care what you think uh, you know I'll deal with it when I come down I said me and you can take care of it when, when I come downstairs because I'm on lockdown and yeah. I got like 20 days left of lockdown well if I get off lockdown I can move back downstairs and it's open open wreck so everybody has access to everybody so he's like okay this, so they get in the thing they ended up writing a thing so no one would get you know split up or, or in trouble for anything to say hey it was a it was a fist fight it was an altercation it's over you know don't worry about it kind of like you know making sure no one gets in trouble for anything everybody takes accountability yeah. for, for what they do because we all know the risk of stuff and so everybody's on kind of the convict code right yeah, and you know that we're not going into it that you're, there's an expectation. No one's trying to get anybody in trouble. No one's, if there's a situation that occurs, you're all adults and you resolve it yourself. You don't, this isn't for elderly. This isn't for children. This isn't for women that can't, you know, physically you know, prevent something from happening to themselves like that. They're not everybody's on the same capable level. Yeah. All right? So <clears throat> we, we resolve things amongst ourselves. At least we try to. So they do that, everything's fine. Now, another incident occurs, and it, the, the same thing with me and the dude. It was always established, like, hey, when I come back down, we'll deal with what we got to deal with, and, and that's it. So the dude... He's out with a, a friend of mine. He's on rep. So a friend of mine comes and says, hey, what's up with this dude? Uh, he wants to know what's up with you because I'm relatively new there. I don't I don't really know anybody. Yeah. So I, I told him, well, let him know that, yeah, that's what's that's what's up. When I moved downstairs, we're going to take care of whatever he wanted to yell and say he was going to do this and do that. We can take care of it when I go down there. I said, it, it's, it's not a problem. So a couple of days go by, he keeps having this. I said, look, get the dude out to the, out of the cell and come upstairs and I'll talk to him directly. Because I don't know this, this dude is just yelling at me through a door. Yeah. Right? So if they get him, Lana gets him out, comes up to my cell, and I said, look, dude, that dude's my friend. If any time one of my friends needs something from me or I can help them, I'm going to help them. I don't, I don't care what you do for your friends or not do for your friends. I said, that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to my friend. I don't want to see my friend get hit once. I don't want him to get hurt at all. Yeah. So I'm going to do all I can to stop that or have somebody change their mind on wanting to do that to, to somebody that I know, friends or family of mine. Everybody knows that's it. There's no guessing to it. This is this is how it is. If, if you have an interaction with these people, this is what the what to expect. That they're, they're going to look out for their side of what they have going on, and, and that's it. So he apologized. I said that's cool. I said, man, if you if you apologize to me and what about, about saying because you didn't have a problem with saying all kinds of disrespectful shit across the deck so everybody can hear so now I assume that you realize now that that wasn't the way to do it and if you you know apologize on that then I know emotions got involved and whatever it's not a big deal to me I'm fine with not doing it I don't want to do anything I don't have to do man yeah 
He's like, okay, so he does that, and we get that taken care of. So, so that's fine. So then another incident happens with the same Ken Strassi guy. So he uh, gets woke up one day, just a couple days later. These guys, and he's being disrespectful, right, to, to the guys. This is black men being disrespectful? No, this was, this was uh, Ken Strassi. Okay. This was uh, the Paul Selly. Paul okay. He got woke up. Uh, the black men and his, and his boys, his guys, Coming in from basketball game, they were they were loud and stuff, just you know being obnoxious and shit like that. Yeah. But this Ken Strassi kid got woke up. He was disrespectful. Uh, he told him to shut up and, and you know use some some disrespectful terms and stuff. So I got up, told him to get off the door. Blackman tells me you should tell him he's wrong. You know I said, dude, that I'm not telling. Him nothing other than get off the door if he disrespected somebody when he gets around that person he can deal with it I'm just telling him right now I, you don't need to be yelling across the the deck like this and, and, and screaming and shit if he has a problem with somebody then he can deal with it when he gets around I mean I don't need to hear this all this wild shit going on so Blackman tells me if you came if, if you want some trouble you came to the right motherfucker and I said, dude, we're not looking at for no trouble, man. And I, apparently they, they took this as a sign of weakness or something. I, I don't know how, what got in their fucking mind, but he had a Polynesian friend that he used to work out with and stuff. So they used to sing this song about these, these cave women or cave bitches or something. I don't know what the fuck it was, but it was so, this Polynesian guy says, hey, did you hear this cave motherfucker? You know, say he ain't got, he goes, yeah, I heard it. That's so why I yelled down at him. I said, George, and this is this is on uh, the record of, of the people that were out when the incident happened and all this shit. His name's George Cotty. So I called down to George. I said, George, you got something to say to me, man? He goes, no, man, I'm just talking to my, my partner down here uh, singing this song. I said, okay, then, then keep it that way and then left it at that. The intentions got more and more kind of stirred up. Yeah. So Blackman decided that he was going to go recruit any brown and black person on the on the deck. So he went to like this wrong group of people, which was some Southern Mexicans. And so they were friends of Paul's. And so they went to Paul and said, hey, dude, this is what going on we're being approached they can run the white boys off the tier and this and me and Paul's really the only ones that are gonna fight that yeah I mean it, <clears throat> and that's just that's just a personal observation uh, from you know my thing I mean I'm sure that if, if they came and got physically um, approached or if their stuff was being taken or they were physically being harmed or something like that then they would respond to it but doing any preemptive shit but all all in all man some of you know unfortunately man you know some of them white dudes are soft right unfortunately that's what in in utah is a little different than uh other places i mean generally whites are minorities in, in a lot of the places but here they're not but and there's a big sack presence there too right you have one minute remaining. There's what well, I'm gonna call you back in a minute. They're gonna, they're Sack. Gonna call, Do you know who Sack is? Soldiers of Aryan Culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's some. There's some around there, but at the time they weren't. They weren't in existence at this time. Okay. So they, they did have another one. They did have another little kind of white crew and stuff that they had out here, but uh, they're in normally when groups like that formulate. It's for, you know, their own security. Yeah. It's, you know, and it's it, all of the people, there's different ethnic groups that just, it's it, it's not necessarily a, a kind of a, a racial overcast decision. It's more of what you're comfortable with. Yeah. You know, it's not, you know, it's just what you're used to being around, you're what your household was, what your friends were, what generally just your social circle 
outside of this. So you're kind of just sticking with your you kind of stick with your own people, whether you're Mexican, black, Thank or white. Thank you for using Global Tel Link. All right. So what we were talking about before the phone went off was <clears throat> that um, people just kind of stick with their own. It's not no racial stuff. Either you're white, you're white, you're black, you're black, you're Mexican, you're Mexican. Things are a little bit racially segregated back then in prison, right? Yes. I mean that's more or less what what it is. Everybody kind of has their own. It's kind of a you know tribal atmosphere, and for the most part, it it works out. For, you know, overall, it, it works out in the sense of people are more comfortable in, in that type of environment because that's what they're accustomed to in their own homes outside of prison, you know, generally. Now, the other, mostly that's in like maximum security facilities is generally where you see the majority of a segregated by choice type environment. Now, with the more medium minimum facility guys would have different kind of jobs and school and different um, activities that you're, you're not so isolated and you're not so locked down so much, then it's, it opens up itself a little differently. Then you, you, you'll see guys eating together or yeah. working out together or something like that. But Let, generally, for the most part, yeah, everybody stays to their, to their own. Let me ask you this, right, Troy? Do you think there was a part, and, and I'm just going to shoot straight, because I've been through this before with a, with a dude, right, a California shot caller, where a dude didn't like me, I didn't like him, man, but we you know, we never really told each other that until one day something happened, and I told him, I said, look, man, don't pretend you like me, I don't like you, you don't like me, and we ended up having a problem. Do you think that that relationship became that way with Blackman, where he didn't like you, and you kind of didn't like him, and it's whatever at, at some point? Yeah, because they, they see <clears throat> who was the threat to them on the tier that how they wanted things to be conducted the way they seen it. You know, because both of us, both of us were from out of state. Yeah. He's from Arkansas. I'm from Nevada. He came in, I believe, January of 94 to, to Utah. I came uh, June of 93 to Utah. And neither one of us has ever lived here before. The environment was so, and, and um, that's the, the shit that I regret the most is the communication between me and him. Because once there was an established that there was a, a problem, neither one of us went past that. We didn't go and say, I mean, now I'm old enough to know that you go and you try to do everything you can to avoid a confrontation. Yeah. Then, then if the confrontation because it's just like recorded history you know what what you haven't resolved through communication you resolve through blood historically that's how it's always been with every species on this planet there that's what it's it's either resolved one way or the other and that's more or less what it is so the regrets I have with that is I didn't have the maturity enough to see this dude as somebody's brother, as somebody's son, as a father of, of two girls. That's the shit that gets to me the most. And he didn't give that to me either. I mean, yeah. you know, so neither one of us were willing to even consider anything else. When I told you before that the penitentiary has a, a way of dehumanizing yeah. uh, individuals, and that's exactly what it is. You, you see this person as a threat, and that's it. You don't see him as a human being. You don't see him as anything other than a threat to you and yours. And that's the, the, the problem I have the most with that, is, is that. Because everything else is just what it is. We all know what we're into you know, we, what we get ourselves into uh, as adults, there's certain risks to things and, you know, there's unpredictable things as well. And in the prison, it's, it can be fine uh, one hour and then absolute disaster, chaos in another hour. You know, one thing I learned, one thing I learned in there, Troy, was this. It took me a long time, too, because you have to understand that, hey, sometimes people want a way out and being in prison and being an aggressive, you know, or, or an alpha male, which, you know, which you are, which I am, you know, not everyone in prison is, 
But sometimes you don't want to give that person a way out and the other person might be looking for it. And it seemed like he kind of was like, nah, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You're going to do what you're going to do. I'm an alpha male. You're an alpha male. It is what it is. As soon as these doors crack and, and we can end up together, there's going to be an issue, right? That's, and that was our understanding with each other. And that was it. Let's, okay, we're going to see who does what to who whenever one of us has the opportunity to do it. And that I'm not going to wait for a guy to come and put a bunch of holes in me before I know that this guy's serious of what he had to say. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh my God, he really meant that. You know, it's like, what? I, I, I think I think he did mean that because I read through all the paperwork that, you know, your wife had sent me all the discovery. And I think it was on both ends. I think that, you know, he was obviously a violent dude and I'm not making any excuses for, you know, why a dude lost his life or anything like that. But at the end of the day, what happens is, hey, look, we got an understanding. I'm going to get you or you're going to get me. And, you know, I talked to a brother from D.C., a black dude that said, hey, look, and we talked about Tommy Silverstein. And he says, you know, that day Tommy Silverstein had the up. And I've seen comments like because, you know, I don't know if you know this, you've been in prison all these years, but. There's people out here with YouTube channels that have done videos about you, right? Um, I actually did one, and, and the mission was to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death in the streets. That's the mission of the channel. And you had said something that resonated with me, man. Um, and you said, hey, I fucked my whole life off. And I was telling kids, man, don't be like this. Don't fuck your whole life off, right? But at the end of the day, I mean, that's that's a, you're an intelligent dude, bro. Regardless, you've been in prison for 20, well, how many years you've been in there? 30 years? Yeah, 30, yeah, 35, uh, October 86 was the last time I've been in, on the streets. Well, you're an extremely I'm intelligent kidding. dude, and your message resonates, but people have said things on these YouTube channels, and that's the point where they're like, oh, man, they jumped that dude. Oh, that dude didn't know that that was going to happen. He had his, you know, his back to them. Can you explain some of that stuff? Because people want to hear about it. No, everybody knew... Uh, the circumstances leading up to it and there was tensions prior to it. Everybody knew that it was just when and, and not if uh, something was going to jump off like that. And this, he, he didn't have to be there. He chose, you know, he chose to be there, uh, had his, you know, little regalia on and little garments and stuff that he, that was not allowed to have. So... It was uh, something that, you know, it, it was just the way it was. It's, it's unfortunate, absolutely, and, you know, I, I don't like the fact that that happened, but it would be worse if it happened to me. And that's, that's of course I feel that. Uh, of course it sucks. No one that I know wants to do something like that or, or enjoys doing something like that because it sucks. That, I mean, it fucks with every part of your life. You, you, you can't eat, you can't concentrate on nothing, you don't have any other alternative that you feel at that time other than to protect you and your friends. That's it. And it's ugly, <clears throat> prison killings are ugly, and like now, we finally see what actual war looks like because of what's going on in Europe. Yeah. War is ugly. It is ugly, and we should avoid it at all costs. You know, just do everything you can to avoid it because it's it's an ugly scene when it's not avoided. And so, people, people, it, 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 if you come at me on a racial level, I'll respond to somebody on a racial level. If you come to me on your hometown fucking banging shit, I'm going to address you as a hometown banging conversation. Yeah. But it just, it's just what it is. You know, it, it, a sports fan, as uh, you know, hometown, uh, what your your tribe, whatever the circumstances, we we align ourselves with certain things uh, in our life that we look at it through that lens. You know, and so I have you know interactions with all kinds of people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Yeah. It's what are the, the issue. what about what about the individual? What about the black guys that are in there now? Do they hate you? Do they dislike you? Do you talk to them? Do you interact with other races? No. Well, 
uh, yeah, one of my closest dudes that I interact with and do business with, uh, known him, you know, 25 years, he's, he's a black dude in here. It's not Mexican dudes, too. I mean, it's, it's not the, the background or, or, or the person, you know, their ethnicity or their nationality or anything like that to me. Either you're a decent dude or you're not. And that's how I address it. And that's how I've always addressed it. You know, I, as a kid, I played sports with, you know, all, I'm from Vegas. It's a diverse uh, city. Yeah. So it, you, you come across all kinds of people in your life, and it's it's not that, you know. It, it, it's not that you're not making a decision of what somebody else is or isn't. You're, you're, you're hopefully you're making your decisions on the kind of person that you are. And that, that's kind of the point that you want to get get across, right? That, look, I didn't kill this. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm going off of what, you know, we've talked about before when we weren't recording. I'm going off of, you know, the stuff in, in the discovery, the, the conversations I've had with your wife. You didn't kill Lonnie Blackman because he was black. That incident happened because you felt threatened, right? I mean, there was animosity. This is prison. This shit happens. Absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. If, 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 it was a, if it was a racial decision, uh, believe me, there's a much of it. Like where I'm from, it's 50% black and 50% everybody else. Out here, it's like the reverse of that. It's like the whites the majority and then there's everybody else. Yeah. But it's not a situation that it is like that. If, if that was the case... I would have no problem saying that was the case. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't give a fuck about that. You know, it's like if that's somebody else's problem. If if they think that that's an issue with something, and their their perception of me or ideology or whatever business practices or whatever the hell I do in my life, that's if they have a problem with it, that's their problem I don't I can't you know change that I, I hope to I'll give somebody an explanation to something like we're having a conversation right now if if I, I think the person is deserving of an explanation I don't mind telling them hey whatever but if they come at me with some kind of crazy shit I'll tell them hey, no fuck you uh, fuck your mother for having you and it, you know what I mean and yeah I'll, I'll be as disrespectful and as out of line as a motherfucker has to be if you're projecting that towards me. If you want to be an asshole, an adult male asshole, that's who I have issue with. It's like, okay, why are we doing this to each other? Like, I already fucked my shit all the way off. Disappointed myself, disappointed my family, my friends, everything else since I was a teenage kid. Yeah. So how is it now that I'm going to, you know, actually consider any kind of other wild ass shit that outside of what reality is? This is what reality is. Let's make the best of it and let's get along. If we can't get along, then let's deal with it and get past it. Yeah, let me. But our species, our species is the worst on earth, man. We hold people, we hold grudges, we penalize fucking people for shit that's been done decades before in their life. We feel that we need to punish and, and, and persecute motherfuckers until they're dead. We're the only species that does that. Yeah. Everything else, you deal with the problem, you you know, and you deal, and you let it go. Troy, let me the problem another. Let me, let me ask you this. Do you feel like, because I mean, obviously I watched the video and so hasn't the world, right? And they painted you as this American racist gladiator. Um, let me ask you this, though. Do you think it was overboard because of what you just said about, you know, us being horrible species where we just punish people? Do you feel that it was necessary to go that far? No, it wasn't. This is, this is the, the problem with the indoctrination in prison survival. And the guys that I was around will contest to this, and they've testified to this. He did what we trained him to do. Our, our instruction to young guys is if a problem occurs, you inflict as much damage as you can without receiving any to 
period. That's it. If I, that's your friend, <clears throat> if that if you're in a in a scenario where your friend is being attacked, then you will help your friend not get attacked. Let me say and this, you, right, Troy? Go ahead. Uh, you know, I spent 18 years in federal prison. I've been in some of the most dangerous prisons in the country. And that's how, you know, that's what prison is. That's how we operate. And the feds, we keep going until the cops come and pull me off you. We don't stop because you say stop or, you know, unfortunately, man, and it's very unfortunate. I, and I want kids that are listening to understand that, that unfortunately, sometimes we, we do. We keep going until, you know, the person's dead or the cops pull us off you. Um, and that could have happened to me. It could have been you that day. It could have been Tommy Silverstein instead of Cadillac Williams. I mean, this is prison and, and, and this is the prison life. This is the life that people don't, you know, kids shouldn't want to be involved in this. They should want to change their lives so they don't end up on that road where they're in a position where, hey, man, I got to kill this person or he's going to kill me. Do you agree with that? Right. And, yeah, I absolutely do. And I've tried to instill in the dudes that I've been around not to make the decisions that I make. This system that I'm in right now, it doesn't take that. It doesn't, I mean, individually, you have to determine, you know, the genuine threat an individual poses to you. Mm -hmm. And there is some that would, you know, would take it to that level. But generally, this system that I'm in right now doesn't have to have that type of response to shit. It just doesn't. It, in other places, it does because you don't know if you're going to get attacked by his friend himself, uh, dude. You know, yeah, somewhere distant, I, distant fucking guy. I want to talk. Know. I do. I do want to talk before before this ends, right? I want to talk about your conditions of confinement. You know, there's kids watching this that are 15, might be 20, might be a dude that just got out. He's back in the street. He's hustling. He's, or maybe there's a dude out there robbing people, and perhaps he could kill someone in the heat of the moment in a robbery, and he could end up on death row. Tell the people where, you, where you're at, man. Are you on death row? Or are you in population? Let's talk about your living conditions no. and how brutal they are. No, no. It's, they've never uh, allowed me to, like, for taking everything else that the prisoners have here. Uh, they changed some shit over the years. They still get me locked down. Um, locked down 22 hours a day. Uh, it's uh, been that way since I've been here. Yeah, I've been in Max my entire time that I've been in Utah uh, in, since June of 93. Um, I've done programming, school, anything that's available to me, I try to participate in. But to know that they're not serious, they're not ever serious about changing anything. Yeah. Because I know a handful of guys that have prison killings. I know a couple of handfuls that have multiple stabbings, staff assaults, all that. Not one of these guys have been approached to participate in any kind of programming to help people not make those decisions. I hear you. So th they really don't give a fuck. If, if it happens, <clears throat> they deal with it. And some people have it a little better than other people because it's more of a favoritism or if you're local, if you're part of the church, if uh, whatever this, the dynamic might be for yeah. that individual determines really his progression in the system, his, his community support, you know, whatever guys he went to school with, some people don't have that at all. I mean, I don't have any local attack. My wife's here, and, and that's it. And the only reason why she's here is because I'm here. Yeah. And, Let me. you know, that's the only support structure I have. Tell the people. My, my rest of my family, my rest of my family's in, in Vegas, and yeah. they've been supportive friends and everything, so. Let me, let me, let me ask you this, right? Or tell the people, man, are you on, are you on death row? No, there's no death row. They dissolved the what you know what they considered death row. They dissolved that a couple years ago. They let these guys go to population now because yeah. their their uh, mantra now is it's not your crime, it's your behavior. Okay, that determines your housing. So there's really not officially a death row anymore. But even when they did have it, they would allow me to participate in stuff limited limited to it or 
similar to it, but to actual housing, I haven't been housed as a whole and as a group since 97. 97 was my last year that we were all in the same section together. Okay. The rest of the guy, there's one other guy here with me, uh, and he goes through some, I don't know what the hell, he's got some litigation shit happening, some hell shit happening, but he's here by choice. Okay. They, they they let the dude stay here instead of being out in population with the rest of the guys. I'm on an override. I'm on an executive director override. And until I can get a director to look at things and reconsider things, I, I ultimately want to go back home to where I'm from. I'm, I'm from Nevada. I yeah. never asked to be sent here. Uh, they did it on a prisoner exchange program against my will. I've been trying to get back ever since. They do annual progress reports on the interstate compact agreement. They say I'm not a problem. I've been disciplinary for, for years. I participate in public, but they still have me locked down. So right now my wife and my attorneys are trying to get some help with them because they did do it on a previous case. It's it's uh, named David Young. He was convicted of a capital crime out here, but was sent to Indiana where he had time. He had 60 years to do out there. They let him transfer back there to do his time, even though he had a death penalty conviction here. While his case was being appealed, he got it reversed. So they actually had him back. He pled to lesser charge uh, and went to a third institution. I believe the guy's back in Indiana now, but at the time he agreed for to go to Minnesota as yeah. a plea agreement. So he was able to transfer uh, even with the capital conviction. That's what I'm trying to do now. If they're not going to allow me to progress like everybody else, which they haven't since I've been here, then return me to the state that I have a detainer on in my original conviction state, the judge sentenced me to the Nevada State Prison. I've never been in front of a court that changed that. They never said, we're giving you due process, we're yeah. changing your jurisdiction, we're changing your custody. No, none of that was ever done. Troy. That's part of my appeals. That's part of my appeals as okay. well. But so you, you got appeals going, you got appeals going now, but is there a death sentence in place? Yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's held because of appellate, you yeah. know, appellate, uh, I haven't exhausted my appellate remedies, you know, it's just, I'm still in a, a state level, federal state level court, and I haven't even got to the court of appeals yet, I, I mean, there's several years okay. uh, left, even if everything went bad, you know, absolute the worst, Yeah, it would, it would still, you know, be you know, eight years or so down the line. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking now that I honestly believe my case will be reversed because my trial was in prison. My trial, I never was in a courtroom. The yeah. uh, legality of my transfer. I mean, I got legitimate reversal. I read a bunch. You know, I read a bunch of your stuff and went over that some of that stuff with your wife too. Um, I mean, you got these appeals. You got some legitimate issues that you're arguing on appeal. But I asked you about the death sentence for a reason, right? And I want this to resonate okay. with kids, man. Does it bother you at night when you go to sleep? Like, damn, man. I mean, were there nights where you were in, had panic attacks? Like, man, these people might kill me. Did that bother you? Right, no, yeah. It used, I mean, that's the whole the, the whole thing of going through all this shit to begin with was to avoid dying. Yeah. <laughs> right? I understand. I mean, that was the whole point of the whole thing was to not allow somebody to kill you. That's, you know, and so that's what, yeah, of course, man, it, for me, just on a, you know, obvious personal level, yeah, you would rather live than not. No doubt. But the the family aspect of things, my wife, the, the other things, what, can I contribute something positive? Uh, absolutely. Because I've always been willing to try to instill in, a young person or an old person or, or whoever to not make these kind of decisions because not only is <clears throat> the consequences like this you don't know what it is they can tell you this is how, what your life's going to be like 
but that doesn't make necessarily make it factual. Yeah. Because they can keep you at the bottom of the fucking thing. I understand. And you mentioned you mentioned you mentioned Silverstein. That dude was a legend in the sense of he didn't come to prison a murderer. Yeah. He came to prison for robbing banks. He ended up killing people in the prison because of the situations that was surrounding him at that particular time. And then when he wasn't, didn't have those barriers, they, they broke him out, the Cubans broke him out, and he didn't go on any kind of killing spree of anything. He, he even, didn't hurt anybody. He even, he even saved the cop at one point where he could have killed no, the cop, and he and didn't. He, Exactly. Let me ask you, talk to him. Troy. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You know, I had heard about you when I was in prison, right? And you know, to a lot of a lot of people, I mean, people are like, "Hey, man, that's Troy Kell." I'm not going to get into that part on here. But what I do want to do is say this because this is the thing that resonated with me. You talked about fucking your whole life off, right? And that's the mission of my channel, bro. I don't do this to make get rich and all this type of shit. I make really good money with my paralegal and prison consultant firm, right? But you said, hey, don't fuck your whole life off, man. Give a message to these kids before we close the show, man. Before this phone hangs up on us. You know, there's some 18-year-old man that might be heading down the wrong road like you were, man. And, and I don't want him to fuck his life off. And you know what? It sounds like you don't either, man. So give that message to them. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, uh, value, value yourself and, and value people around you. You know, that, that, that's... Most of the time, we don't want to listen to uh, family and things. We know everything as teenagers and got it figured out. But uh, majority of the time, uh, your folks know what it is or adults know what it is and don't want you to make the same mistakes they did. You shouldn't have to learn by getting burnt that the damn fire is hot. You know, it's uh, you, you can make your own common sense to tell you, yeah, it is. You don't have to actually go burn yourself to have an understanding of what it is. So absolutely just, you know, value value everything, you know, more than what you do. We take a lot of stuff for granted. Our freedom is one, our lives are another. Um, we see all too well, you know, now that you're here one minute and gone the next. So, you know, you just try to avoid that. You know, if you, if you want to have something for yourself and your family, you know, and that, that's my, my biggest thing is, you know, all that's gone for me. I can't help any sick person in my family yeah. at all. I can't be there when my folks need me or uh, any any friend or anything actually needs somebody to talk to. I don't have the liberty of talking to somebody whenever I feel like it. Troy, do, you, do, your, structured. do your parents come to visit you? Yeah, I'm very fortunate, and my my family and friends, uh, as a child, as you know, every my whole life, they've been nothing but supportive, and I'm a very fortunate person with that. Um, I, I don't see my folks as much as I would like to, either, because they still live in Vegas. They're they're alive, they're doing well, but they're getting older, yeah. you know, and. It, because the pandemic and shit like that, it's really shut down a lot of shit. You have one minute remaining. So my wife does it. My wife does a lot of that for me, and yeah. you know, makes sure that they're okay and stuff like that. And I get to see my wife, you know, every week and. That's what's up. You know, Look, so man, cool, man, I know it's not easy. Keep your head up. I'm going to talk to your wife. I don't know when you can call again, but I'd like to talk to you again without us recording, man, where we can just talk no. and get some things Absolutely. figured out. All right? I'm cool. Hey, I'm cool with whatever, man. If, if I can help in any way, man, I'm, I'm here. You know, I'm well, willing to do it. So, yeah, get with my wife and see if she can let me know and then we can arrange whatever, man. I appreciate everything, though. Well, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story, man, your experiences. And honestly, man, I think you got a hell of a message and you're an extremely intelligent dude, man. I know life ain't easy in there. I do feel that you regret and that you have some remorse for some of the things that you did. And unfortunately, you went to prison as a young man and you know, you ended up doing things that, you know, unfortunately, man, you felt you had to do at the time. But, you know, people do change. There has to be consequences for actions, but people do Thank change. Thank you for using Global Telling. Well, that's the interview with Troy Kell, man. Um, We'll probably do another part, part two. But 
that's what it's about, man. That's what needs to resonate right now with people, right? Like, think about it, man. This kid went to jail when he was 18, man. Prison makes you do things that in normal society you wouldn't do. Normal society, you're not, you know, stabbing people because you got in an argument. Um, you're not stabbing people when someone's like, oh, man, I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to kill you when I see you. You know, sometimes a lot of people are just talking, but when you're in prison, federal prison, state prison, you know, sometimes when a guy says he's going to kill you, he really means it if he gets an opportunity. You know, I don't know all the details. I went through the paperwork. I've, I've done a, a mountain of research on this case. Um, but I thought people might want to hear from Troy, man, and, and that's why we brought him on. If you guys want a part two, you let me know. And we'll push for a part two. We'll get back on the phone with Troy. You guys got questions that you want answered? Ask them. Send them to me. Send them to me on an email. I'll write them down. I'll print them. And we'll ask Troy. It's real and it's raw, man. Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out. Thank you.